You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Struggling to secure on prem apps with modern identity? Don't worry, you're not alone. Join industry leaders from Fortune 500 organizations to secure your apps on any cloud with any IDP, regardless of your environment's complexity. Meet Strata's identity orchestration platform, Mavericks. Say goodbye to the headaches of app refactoring and legacy tech debt. With identity orchestration, you can modernize legacy apps to use MFA or passwordless authentication in a few weeks, migrate from one IDP to another, and so much more without changing the app. No matter your IAM use case, Strata extends the value of your current identity investments. And the best part? You can try it for free today. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire to share your biggest identity challenge, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. The U.S. scrutinizes Chinese telecoms. Indonesia's National Data Center is hit with ransomware. Red Juliet targets organizations in Taiwan. Researchers can tell where you're going by how fast you get there. A previously dormant botnet targeting Redis servers becomes active. Thousands of customers may have had info compromised in an attack on Levi's. A new industry alliance hopes to prevent memory-based cyber attacks. Our guest, C.U. Mo, Assistant National Cyber Director in the Office of the National Cyber Director at the White House, shares the nuances of the White House's skills-based approach with N2K President Simone Petrella. And Assange agrees to a plea deal. It's Tuesday, June 25th, 2024. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is your CyberWire Intel Briefing. Thanks for joining us. It is great to have you with us. In an exclusive, Reuters reports that the Biden administration is investigating China Mobile, China Telecom, and China Unicom over concerns they could share American data with Beijing through their U.S. cloud and Internet businesses. Despite being barred from providing telephone and retail Internet service in the U.S., these companies still have a small presence, including cloud services and routing Internet traffic, giving them access to American data. Neither the Chinese firms nor their U.S. lawyers commented, and the Justice Department and Commerce Department declined to comment, The Chinese embassy in Washington accused the U.S. of unjustly targeting Chinese companies. Reuters found no evidence of the firm's intentionally sharing sensitive U.S. data with the Chinese government. However, the investigation is part of a broader U.S. effort to prevent China from exploiting data access for national security risks. Regulators have not decided on actions but might block transactions, limiting the firm's U.S. operations. China Mobile, China Telecom, and China Unicom have faced U.S. scrutiny for years. The FCC revoked their licenses due to national security concerns, citing instances of misrouting Internet traffic through China. The company's points of presence in the U.S. Internet infrastructure are also under scrutiny, as they could allow data manipulation. The Commerce Department is also probing their U.S. cloud services, fearing access to personal information and intellectual property could be compromised. A particular focus is on a China mobile-owned data center in Silicon Valley, raising concerns about potential data mishandling. Indonesia's National Data Center, operated by the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, was hit by ransomware on June 20th, disrupting several services. The attack impacted at least 210 institutions, including immigration services, which led to delays in processing visas, passports, and residence permits. 
The data center, known as the National Data Center, was compromised by a ransomware variant called Brain Cipher, identified as Lockbit 3.0. Local reports highlighted significant disruptions, including the shutdown of online student registration in some regions. President Joko Widodo recently ordered a halt on developing new applications, including the shutdown of online student registration in some regions. Suspected Chinese state-sponsored hackers, identified as Red Juliet, have targeted numerous organizations in Taiwan, including universities, state agencies, and electronics manufacturers, according to cybersecurity research by Recorded Futures Insect Group. Red Juliet, also known as Flax Typhoon, has been active since mid-2021 and was discovered by Microsoft last year. The group focuses on Taiwan's economic policies and diplomatic relations, targeting technology companies, aerospace firms, and religious organizations. Red Juliet exploits Internet-facing devices like firewalls and VPNs for initial access. Operating from Fuzhou, China, the group is expected to continue high-tempo cyber espionage activities focusing on Taiwanese technology and government sectors. Researchers anticipate ongoing reconnaissance and exploitation of public-facing devices globally. Researchers at Graz University of Technology in Austria discovered a vulnerability they've named Snail Load, which allows spying on users' online activities by monitoring fluctuations in their internet speed. This attack does not require malicious code or intercepting data traffic, and potentially could affect all end devices and internet connections. In a snail load attack, the victim's internet connection speed is monitored during interaction with a server, revealing patterns unique to specific websites or videos. Researchers achieved a 98% success rate in identifying online videos and 63% for basic websites, with higher success on slower connections. Closing this loophole is challenging, as it would require providers to randomly slow down internet connections, affecting time-critical applications. P2P Infect, initially a dormant peer-to-peer -peer malware botnet targeting Redis servers, has become active, deploying ransomware and a crypto miner. Cato Security, monitoring the botnet, suggests it may function as a botnet for hire, First identified in July of 2023, P2P Infect exploits Redis vulnerabilities and spreads via a replication feature. By late 2023, it had increased breach attempts but remained inactive. In May 2024, a new variant began downloading ransomware, encrypting files, and deploying a Monero miner. The ransomware targets various file types, while the miner uses all available processing power sometimes hindering the ransomware. P2P Infect also employs a user mode rootkit to hide its activities. Its precise operational structure remains unclear, but it poses a significant threat to Redis servers. Clothing brand Levi's has revealed that tens of thousands of customer accounts may have been compromised in a credential stuffing attack. On June 13th, an unusual spike in website activity indicated that attackers were using credentials obtained from other breaches to access Levi's accounts. The main office of the Attorney General reported that just over 72,000 individuals were affected. Levi's forced a password reset for all impacted accounts the same day. Although no fraudulent purchases were made, attackers could view personal information like order history, names, emails, addresses, and partial payment details. Levi's advised users to reset passwords and check personal information accuracy to prevent future attacks. The Cherry Alliance has been formed to promote the adoption of Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions, that's Cherry, a project designed to prevent memory-based cyber attacks. The alliance includes the University of Cambridge, Capabilities Limited, chipmaker Codasip, the FreeBSD Foundation, Low Risk, and SCI Semiconductor, developed by researchers at the University of Cambridge with support from the UK and US governments, 
Cherry provides fine-grained memory protection and scalable software compartmentalization. The alliance aims to overcome commercial adoption hurdles by developing standardization and compliance guidelines. Despite the cost of porting operating systems being a significant challenge, the alliance seeks to coordinate businesses and adopters to deliver market value. ARM is conspicuously not part of the alliance, although they have created demonstration motherboards using Cherry and say they may incorporate it into products if customers demand it. Coming up after the break, our N2K president, Simone Petrella, speaks with CU Mo, Assistant National Cyber Director at the White House. Stay with us. When it comes to ensuring your company has top-notch security practices, things can get complicated fast. Vanta automates compliance for SOC 2, ISO 27001, HIPAA, and more, saving you time and money. With Vanta, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our listeners can claim a special offer of $1,000 off Vanta at vanta.com slash cyber. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash cyber for $1,000 off Vanta. The IT world used to be simpler. You only had to secure and manage environments that you controlled. Then came new technologies and new ways to work. Now, employees, apps, and networks are everywhere. This means poor visibility, security gaps, and added risk. That's why Cloudflare created the first-ever connectivity cloud. Visit cloudflare.com to protect your business everywhere you do business. C.U. Mo is Assistant National Cyber Director at the Office of the National Cyber Director at the White House. Our own N2K President Simone Petrella recently caught up with C.U. Mo. Here's their conversation. I am so thrilled to have C.U. Mo from the White House here today. And for context for everyone listening, in July of 2023, so just about last year this time, ONCD, the Office of the National Cyber Director, put out the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy. So, see you to kick things off, we're about a year in. How are we doing on progress on the strategy? I, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk about uh, what we're trying to do here uh, at the White House on Cyber Workforce and Education. Uh, and you are right, uh, time flies. I mean, the, the strategy has been out for almost a year, not quite. And uh, we are really excited to uh, kind of give like a progress report about what we're doing, how we're doing. Um, but I can't stress enough that, you know, um, I, I say this all the time. I want it to be a repeating again, is that uh, the White House Office of National Cyber Director, ONCD, is not the first office that is trying to solve um, the cyber workforce and education issue. Um, a lot of people have been doing a lot of good work throughout the years. So, um, you know, I just want to suggest that, you know, we're not the only one and we're not doing this alone. It's just always good to start off by acknowledging all the good work that's been done and then talk about how we can collectively move everything forward together. Yeah. I think one of the things that I'd love to sort of kick off on is that there is, you know, a progress report that you are all looking to, to release here in the coming days. Can you tell us a little bit about what we can expect to see as that report becomes public? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, the report essentially reaffirms that uh, the foundation of uh, solving the national cyber workforce and education issue is sort of like kicks all of us. Um, you know, we we are talking about 
what we are doing as part of the National Taboo of post education Strategy, which I will call the mouthful, which I will call uh, the strategy from now on. Uh, so what the strategy uh, is prescribing is that, you know, there are three broad issues in um, uh, what we're facing today, right? Not enough Americans are uh, considering a career in cyber or cybersecurity. Uh, they either don't see someone like them in the field or, or uh, they don't know anyone um, who, who are in the field or they always assume that it's a narrow and technical role. Like, you know, the, the old cliche of like the, the guy in a hoodie, you know, yeah. hacking and defending in the dark room kind of thing, right? So that's one issue. And the second issue is training and uh, education opportunities uh, have not been able to keep up with the demand, right? So that's the second issue. And the third issue is the um, the idea that we don't have enough locally driven collaboration to connect people to jobs, connect people to training, or provide wrap around, wrap around services so that workers can get the support that they need to actually pursue a cyber career. So what you will see in this report is sort of like a narrative on some of the progress that we have made on all of these three areas, right? I can go into it in more detail later on, but just to sort of like frame the, the conversation here um, is that, you know, from the federal government standpoint, uh, ONCD is coordinating with 34 other federal agencies so that we are all doing this collectively. And then we are also uh, working with uh, non-federal government organizations, right? Like private sector employers, academia, state, local, um, and territorial governments uh, to actually, you know, move the ball forward together. And we have commitments from over a hundred organizations. So, you know, I can go into a little bit more detail, but what folks should like, like to see is some progress on those three broad areas. And then a narrative on what are some of the, um, priorities that we have in the future uh, in regarding to the, those three areas. One of the things, and see, so you know you know, this is very near and dear to my heart, yeah. but from the spring, um, there's been a lot of releases coming out of the White House and then subsequent reporting on the emphasis on a skills-based approach for employers, but also the federal government. I was hoping, you know, you could sort of provide a bit of explanation and clarification on what does it mean to do a skills-based approach in cyber? And what does that mean from an ONCD perspective? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think many of us always relate skill-based approach to only skills-based hiring, right? I think I want to kind of put a stop to this and say, hey, it's actually more than hiring, but oftentimes um, the work starts at hiring. Right, because when when we think about skill based approaches, uh, we have to think about the skills that are necessary to do a particular job, which lends itself to changes and updates in a job description. The reality is, a lot of Americans have uh, certain skills, uh, and they have acquired either from a job or from a training, but they might not have an official certification or, or degree. So when you focus on skills. What we're doing is that we are making sure that we are not we are removing and lowering the barriers uh, without lowering the standards, right? Yeah. So that allows us to actually build the best team possible to achieve the mission that we want. And it makes a lot of sense because, you know, if you don't have that understanding of your requirements to begin with, how do you actually start the process, continue the process. Like you can't implement it for anyone without doing that sort of foundational workload. That's right. So when we think about skills use approach, it has to start from the very top, right? From a strategic level about what are the skills that we need to accomplish the mission. So that we believe gives you a more flexible way of thinking about talent and the pipeline. We're not going to get there right away, right? And I think, you know, and I totally understand it as you're trying to promote skill-based approaches all across the country, we realize that the federal government has to lead by example. And as you know, Simone, like making changes in federal government is difficult, but there are areas when we kind of get a lot of people together. And that's why we, you know, worked with Office of Personnel Management, OPN, and Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and our 34 other uh, federal agencies. There's a way for us to sort of get going, right? Get as much of the processes converted to skill-based approach. And that's what we announced in April of this year at the White House convening for good paying, uh, meaningful jobs in cyber, 
is uh, let's take one occupation series uh, in the federal government. So this is like the broad categories of jobs uh, that affects a lot of cyber workers. And we found that about 60%, a little bit more than 60% of uh, cyber workers in the federal government is uh, covered under the 2210 information technology and management series. So what we have decided collectively is the administration will uh, modernize, right, the 2210 occupation theory into school-based approaches, right? So that means, you know, we're going to try to go as far as we can, right? Starting from minimum qualifications, right? Looking at roles and all these different things. I don't want to sort of prejudge the um, actual outcome, but to, to know that, you know, it's more than just hiring, it's the whole approach itself. And the staffers are currently like working really hard because we have a deadline of sort of getting this done by the summer of 2025. I hope we're trying to adopt a lot of best practices. OPM is talking to the inner agency. We are talking to the inner agency as to try to set this up. Given the deadline that's coming up for summer of 2025, you know, just to maybe dispel any concerns that anyone listening would have, that obviously sounds like a big deadline, but what, like, what's the volume of job descriptions that we're talking about here? Just because I want to kind of be able to make clear to an audience that it might not necessarily take you a year, even though the federal government for, you know, 100,000 occupation series, you know, positions. Well, I <laughs> What I will point out is um, a lot of all this work um, are ongoing, right? And this is just sort of like the culmination of it. When, when you're making policy changes like that, we have to remember this is, you know, people's livelihood. We want to do it right. Uh, we don't want to rush. We don't want to rush it. And uh, we want to make sure that we follow the processes that we have in place. The 2210s exist in a lot of different departments and agencies. Yeah. So, you know, we want to make sure that everyone's equity is represented here. I think the signal that we're sending, right, like the takeaway here is if an organization as large as the federal government is willing to do this, I think you, like all of us, organizations, big or small, all across the country, not just in Washington, D.C. or the tech capitals around the country, my hope is everyone kind of comes together to really look at how they can take advantage of the benefits that skill-based approaches can provide, right? Think about the business objectives that you have, the mission that your organization is trying to deliver. Think about the skills that you need as you come up with a workforce strategy, like a talent plan that you have. And then, so think about how you can kind of create a pipeline, set up sort of like the, the, the workforce mixture that you need. Like not everyone has, you know, not everyone has to have, you know, not everyone has, has to be the most senior and technical person. It might be like, you know, a mix, a combination of like some senior and true level, right? So I feel like when you start thinking about skills in that sense, that opens up uh, how you think about your workforce and then in turn change how you'll go about recruiting and retention, reskilling and upskilling. That's sort of like the key thing here that we're trying to push for is, yes, it's more than just about removing a degree requirement. I happen to believe that degrees are extremely helpful. This is more about how can we take a more agile approach in thinking about skills and talent and workforce. And the benefit is it opens up pathways for more folks who might not have the right technical degree. You know, like Simone, you and I, you know, we've seen some of these famous or popular cyber people, they are like philosophy majors or like musicians. Yeah. If you think about like, hey, we need, you know, CS degree only, then you kind of miss out on all these other talent, right? I think that's that's what we're pushing for. Yeah. I mean, I just want to like emphasize what you said right at the beginning. I think the takeaway is if the federal government can embark and sort of lead truly by example as the largest employer in the United States, then we should be able to do it in our own organizations too and and take that right. step and invest in it. Well, see, thank you so much for sharing updates on where things are with ONCD and the progress of the strategy. Uh, exciting things to come. That's CU Mo, Assistant National Cyber Director in the Office of the National Cyber Director at the White House, speaking with our N2K President, Simone Petrella.
And now a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the leader in operationalizing cybercrime analytics. Traditional threat intelligence is a thing of the past. Cyber criminals are stealing vast amounts of credentials, session cookies, and financial data every day, and it's hard to keep up. SpyCloud is the trusted partner businesses turn to to fully understand their darknet exposure risk and neutralize threats before it's too late. SpyCloud alerts your organization as soon as an employee or customer's data appears on the dark net, so you can act faster than bad actors to prevent cyber attacks like ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. With insights from the industry's largest repository of recaptured data, protect the digital identities and systems most important to your business. Get your free corporate darknet exposure report at spycloud.com slash cyberwire and see what information criminals have in their hands today. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And finally, Julian Assange, founder of WikiLeaks, agreed to plead guilty to one felony of illegally obtaining and disclosing national security material, securing his release from a British prison. The plea, part of a deal, means Assange, now age 52, will be sentenced to time served, about five years. He will appear in a remote federal court in Saipan before returning to Australia. Assange's extradition fight has been a saga, with his supporters claiming his actions were in the public interest. Meanwhile, U.S. officials argue he endangered lives and national security. After years in Belmarsh prison, his release will mark the end of this particular chapter. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Trey Hester, with original music by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producers are Jennifer Iben and Brandon Carr. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Attention all security professionals. Want real-time IP intelligence at your fingertips? Sign up for Scout Insights free trial today. Get immediate insights into threats, search any IP with no training required, and enjoy intuitive graphical results. Whether you need to identify compromised hosts or enrich Splunk queries, Scout Insight has you covered. Don't wait. Accelerate your threat response now. Visit teamcumry.com slash cyberwire to start your free trial.